Hello again, welcome. It's another edition of the Brattlecast. We have well over 100 episodes, and each one of them is fascinating. It certainly is to me. I'm Jordan Rich, and I get the the real honor and pleasure of sitting down with Ken Gloss, the proprietor of the Brattle Bookshop in Boston on West Street, uh, one of the finest antiquarian bookstores in the world, I would say. And uh, here you have been back now to the studio for one podcast. This is the second podcast back. It's great to see you after a year of seeing you on screen. So thank you. And you bring goodies with you. You bring stuff that just blows my mind. What do you have in front of us right now? Well, there's a lot of talk nowadays about militias. And I think sometimes there are similarities when you go into the past. Some things are totally different. But the word keeps coming up more and more and more. And and whenever that happens, more people are interested in what it is and also in collecting material and in looking back into the past. And, of course, the way you learn about how things were is you go back. So we had a customer uh, send us some pictures by email a few months ago, and they had some things, and we went through it. Most of it was, yeah, they're old, they're nice, they're interesting, they're not terribly valuable. And then there was one here, the Exercise for the Militia of the Province of Massachusetts Bay by order of His Excellency, the King. And it's printed in Boston by a man named John Draper, print, printed to His Excellency, the Captain General. So that was the governor, mm-hmm. basically, of the province in 1758. <laughs> so th- this is for people who collect military items, you can in militia items, I mean, obviously, you can get things relatively recent. You can also go back to World War II, World War I, but how military how uh, worked. And then you get back into how units worked in the Civil War, and there were a lot of infantry guides and that. And then you go back to the Revolution and how they recruited people, how they formed guards. And, of course, what you hear about a lot of times now is how the militia goes back to originally that they formed, uh, you know, citizens' bands. Well, of course, they didn't have an army very well. Or the British army is all they had. Right, right. And when you got out into the the hinterlands, which might, again, only be a few miles from the major cities of the oceans, you needed militias to protect yourself. Uh, mm-hmm. Although the relationships with the Native American Indian tribes were sometimes very good, I mean, they were also, they wanted to keep their land. Uh, So this one is from 1758, which is right around the time of the French and Indian War. But it literally, I mean, even if you just, it's a little frayed at the edges, but uh, the exercise of the militia, and it basically... Uh, will tell you uh, it's to uh, guard the property of the free government to depend on the soldiery of the area. And this goes on to tell you how how many people should be in the militia. How do you uh, get a militia to come? How do you form one? Uh, you know, a uh, body of men fixed in that spot, whether they come to action or not. Mm. So it, it's telling how they drill them, mm-hmm. how they uh, form, how they, what type of uh, instruments they need, what, uh, of forming the battalion. And you have to think, you know, you go back to the 1700s and, you know, most of the people were farmers. And there might be a few tradespeople There might be a few that were working the waterways and so on, but most people were just farmers. So it wasn't like as organized a god. Now, a lot of it was dependent on the British Army. There were were British soldiers here who were there to protect. But if all of a sudden you were having uh, either uh, tribes come in or the French, which were up in Canada coming in or who— also had forces of Native Americans and Indians and so on. On their side, you had them on your side. 
But you wanted to be able to very quickly to be able to call up a military force to protect yourself. Were these volunteers or do you know, were they, certainly were they paid uh, to do Well, work? they were volunteers for the most okay. part. Right. And, and getting paid in those times was a challenge too. <laughs> uh, but it was more volunteers because, I mean, if you had... Self-interest. Right? Self-interest. Yeah. I mean, you wanted to protect not only the central community, but... You also wanted to have a place that if your, let's say, farm was a, a little way out, where you also could retreat to mm -hmm. and then have a group of men who were, I guess you could say, quote, trained uh, and had the weapons. But, but this sort of – you sort of go back through the history and it's just amazing. And then again, you sort of touch this in uh, evolutions for the military. Uh, second part – Take care. Join your right hand to your uh, fire lock. Recover your arms. Cock the fire lock. Hmm. And then it gives instructions how to use your gun. It, it's, how the, you... it's the website of its time, basically. It's a magazine yeah. format of everything you need to know to be in the militia. Uh, worth of command to be given when instructing the men in the uh, uh, force. Explanation. And then it gives whole explanations. Because you have to figure that most of these people were not military-oriented. Even the people who formed the militias mm. weren't that military. So the governor of Massachusetts wanted to give a, a way of how to train, how to do it. And this one actually is incredibly rare because 1750s is starting to get back a long, long time ago – and uh, I think there are only two or three copies known of it in uh, in libraries, although I'm sure there must be others. It's got the uh, the old English lettering. Um, it says sold A L F O. I assume that's also the F looked like it, it was, it, F. There were whole grammatical rules for when you used an F and an S, <laughs> and and it. Well, as we always, we sometimes go off a little bit in tangents. Yes. But my my last name is Gloss. If I talk to someone on the phone or a lot of times and they're not English speaking, you know, that's not their first language, a lot of times they'll hear Gloff. Mm -hmm. And S's and F's actually sound very similar mm. and they'll spell it G-L-O-F-F -F mm. instead of S-S. And you, you know, if you're native English speaking, you don't think of that. But when you start pronouncing a lot of these words, F and S, and there were very detailed grammatical rules of when you use the F as opposed to the S, and that slowly but surely over the centuries is mostly S now. It's a lucky thing because here's a sentence. Uh, but to affect to bear arms and not to know or learn the youth as in use of them, is worf, the meaning worse, than slavishness and slavishness and treachery. So you have to really be a, uh, somebody who can parse them as you go. Well, it, it's interesting because if you start reading this and you get used to it, it, it actually do, does it yeah. very quickly. And it, it, and it still is, it's not Middle English where you really have to translate. Right. It's it's uh, English, and in, in also when you read this, you also have to realize that probably a large part of the militia, this was probably more for the commander, the because officer. they were not necessarily uh, literate, were they, many of well, them? Well, a, a portion were, but yeah. there was a good portion that, no, they yeah. weren't terribly right. Right. literate, and especially to the point of... Uh, owning uh, manuals. No, this was more for the commander. And part of the, the idea of a militia was someone local in the community would organize everything. It wasn't necessarily the state organizing it. It was the local people taking control. And, and of course, some of that, you get into politics nowadays, you know, you go back to this time and in this era, that made a lot of sense you go to modern times and you can argue one way or the other very much. And of course, it's 1758 or so, so there are no states. There's Massachusetts Bay, which it was the, the yeah. name it was referred to as. Well, the colonies sure. and, and 
But then there were, you know, the the New York colony, and there was the Georgia colony. Oh, yeah, yeah. And but the, it was Massachusetts Bay, right? Massachusetts Bay. Yeah, no, there were no United States. It right. was, well, it was a good 20, 20 years before the revolution. But there was still a lot of conflict, and a lot of the conflict was between different countries in Europe. Like I say, this was around the French and Indian War. The reason it's named the French and Indian War is the French had a lot of the native tribes, especially up north and in the Canadian area, and they were trying to gain power over the English. The English wanted to keep their land, uh, and some of this was encouraged. Also, the tribes themselves were fighting among each other. Right. And, you know, I mean, some of those, like I say, a lot of those tribes were not necessarily peaceful among each other. They wanted the better land, the, the more power. And so, uh, you know, you could be with one and then another would come in and it, it was it was dangerous. It was a very, very hard life. What would something like that be worth these days, Ken? Uh, this would probably be in the five to $10,000 range. Oh, boy. So, I mean, <laughs> if you had one 20 years later in the Revolutionary War, it's yeah. worth a lot less. First of all, there were a lot larger population. Right. But there was a real sort of organized war going on at that time. And so there were much more organized troops, battalions. It was more of a, a formal war. Mm. And so there was a lot more instructional books and so on. And then when you got to the War of 1812, there were even more. And then as you got to the Civil War, there was there, you know, there were a few hundred dollars. Mm. Uh, and then, of course, you get into uh, infantry, infantry tactics mm -hmm. and all of that. Yeah, there, there's a on. big market for military material, isn't there? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, you always what – I, what I, one of the ways I talk about wars and military and military collecting, they always look better 20, 30 years after they end. Indeed. And, and, but there's always – the fascination, the the exploration, the hunt, the the adventure, and you have to remember a lot of it was adventure. I mean, you could have someone in one of these militias, and if they went out, they might meet someone ten miles away that they might never see, and and so the military has also always been a way of getting away from home. Mm. Uh, you know, getting onto the new frontier, seeing the world, seeing the world, Absolutely. and and you know, some of that turns out well, some of it's not not as well. This one's come down a lot of years. Absolutely, what a great story that accompanies that piece, as Ken said, worth five to ten grand, uh, and it's just one of many incredible pieces of value that you bring along, and we appreciate that very, very much. Well, it, you know, one of the things, even though I'm sure the audience really enjoys seeing this, <laughs> uh, but it's funny because when you talk about something and you just are talking about it, it, it it's one thing. But when you have two people and they see it and touch it, and, and one thing I will say to people if they're interested in this and come into the store, we have a lot of things we can show off. I love when really younger children come in and we can pull out a page from the 1400s and say, here, mm -hmm. touch this, and they're touching something 500 years old, or a military person comes in and this is something that's you know, 250, 60 years old. And it's amazing how just touching it sort of, I don't know, it, 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 well, it, it, brings a, 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 it brings it to life. It elevates you, uh, and, it, and it urges me to want to know more. That's why these Brattlecasts are so much fun. Ken, well, thank you. As always, you can find out more at brattlebookshop.com and continue to join us as you subscribe and download the podcast called The Brattlecast. We'll see you next time.